You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. The tank crews proceeded down the narrow pass. The tanks were fully armed with shells and machine guns. Their pride was high. Their aim clear. They had the best technology, best quality equipment of their time, 1935. The crews were skilled and guided by relatively new aircraft. And they had practiced their mission. But in the mountain passes, the going was slow, and the aircraft couldn't help as much. Then there were clanks. What was that? Piece of equipment? More clanks. And soon a cascade of them. It was rifles from attackers in the hilltops near them, hitting their armor. Surprising at first, but no matter. A few rifle shots weren't going to pierce a tank. And the crew responded with machine gun fire. They were Europeans, a modern army, operating in Africa. Their opponents, so the cartoons printed in newspapers in their home country, told them. Their opponents were buffoonish and antiquated, with spears for weapons. Okay, they didn't just have spears. They had some rifles, but still, no match. And as they sprayed some machine gun fire, the enemy turned tail and ran like they thought they would. They were visible now. The uniforms were not the savage dress that they expected, those that they saw in those cartoons. They had cotton, khaki-looking outfits. Some had white helmets. But none the matter. They were running. The threat was neutralized. Then came the boulder. Rolled down the hill and stopped them in their tracks. The tank crew tried to reverse, but could not. There was a line of tanks behind them. More rifle shots. Clank, clank. The noise was deafening. A tank is a pretty intimidating vehicle, but inside, an Italian tank, just a crew of two. Then, mortar fire. They have mortars? And a grenade blew up one of their tanks. Another was simply set on fire. Others were swarmed by so many warriors, even not well armed, so many bodies surrounding the tanks hitting them with hammers, getting into the wheel structure, getting into the tracks and the tractor. Could no longer hear the sounds on their radios. Would they be set on fire? They opened up the turret and took a chance. Christos! Christos! they said. Of what little they knew about the country they were fighting, the emperor of that country, Haile Selassie, was a Christian. This crew was spared taken by men with rifles and swords. Other crews were not spared. The infantry that accompanied these crews, the tanks had been sent to save them to overpower the enemy, and now they were stopped. The infantry surrendered. But their ambushers either didn't know what hands up meant or didn't care. Thus, the Italian excursion into Ethiopia got a bit of a rough start, especially in the higher terrain the rougher terrain of what is largely, despite what your image of Ethiopia might be, largely mountain country. But this story of resistance wasn't so common in the war we're describing, the brief Italian-Ethiopian war. Mobilized units were making progress in the north of the country, but none of it was fast enough for Italy's leader, Benito Mussolini. He had already sacked his main general for moving too slow. Two weeks after, he gave him a medal. The next general had pleaded, Duce, I plan slowly, methodically, so I may take swift action later. That line didn't work. Move fast, move forward, nothing else. It was a unique place in the world of 1935 that the Italians were attacking. Ethiopia was a completely African-run country, bordered by French, British, and Italian colonies. Its emperor, Tofani, or Hali Selassie, was crowned in 1930. It was the first African monarch crowned in the 20th century. Ethiopia trade had coffee exports, a railroad, a growing capital, Addis Ababa, Pleasant Spring. It 
also had an army and an air force, a small one, about 13 planes. It was a player on the world stage. Ali Selassie had traveled the world. The Duke of Gloucester, that's the king, that's the British king's son, was at his swear-in ceremony. He was on the front page of Time magazine when he was sworn in. He had military advisors from Britain, Belgium. Ethiopia had been a member of the League of Nations since 1923. To be sure, there were some things at least moderns would see was wrong with the picture here. The country, called Abyssinia, was after all a monarchy, not a democracy, with a privileged nobility. And it had slavery, not officially. Ali Selassie had banned it and had reinforced that band with an edict when his country joined the League of Nations. But his edict wasn't always followed, nor enforced, by the nobles who practiced slavery. That didn't stop the nation from having tremendous worldwide support. A world community, really, would be set up in the coming years to support Ethiopia. In London, Jamaica, in the United States, Canada, there were organizations that would develop to support this country because it was the hopes of so many people who were non-white. Who were non-white. In Jamaica, it would decades later reach religious proportions. Selassie would be a living then a martyred saint. He would be honored in the music of Bob Marley and other reggae artists. Bloody, bloody, bloody. And that's because this story, so often told in the history books, is just a quick blip before we get to World War II, about an Italian victory, which in the initial phase it was, was really, in the end of the day, a victory for Ethiopia. But first they'd have to fight. Selassie certainly hadn't sought out any fight with any major European power. Indeed, he had visited nations all over the world for exactly the contrary purpose, to avoid fighting, to be internationally recognized. He even visited the Italian king in Rome in 1928, signed a treaty with that nation. The nation of Japan liked having a non-European world power. An Indian public opinion was with Ethiopia. Meetings were held throughout that British colony, not yet an independent nation, and resolutions were sent to the emperor of support. Britain's own government, just elected under conservative Stanley Baldwin, ran on a promise to support the League, to support collective security, which implied supporting its members, not letting one attack another. The opposition party in Britain, Labour, was even more for collective security and anti-fascist forcing that policy. None of this, as it turned out, mattered very much. From the New York Times, October 6th, 1935. The war started last week. In Rome on Wednesday, Premier Mussolini dispatched a telegram ordering his men on the march into Ethiopia. Addis Ababa on Thursday, Emperor Haile Selassie also sent a message to his people by a method far older than the telegraph. Thumping war drums carried the command. Gabere, Gabere, to war, to drummers on the mountain peaks surrounding his capital. By then, it was relayed to other drummers, and so on, and so forth, to other drummers and others, until the call for arms had been spread throughout the land. That same day, the first casualties were registered. Mussolini was menacing for a variety of reasons. He kept talking about taking Ethiopia before it happened in the run-up. The Ethiopians were nationalists, and he claimed they threatened liberation of his Italian colonies. They could inspire internal revolutions there. He also wanted to redeem that loss in 1896. Biggest European loss in Africa up to that time by an African opponent. He even argued there was nothing else left in Africa. Here's what he says. Only the crumbs of colonial booty were left for us at the end of World War. We've been patient with Ethiopia for 40 years. It is enough now.
Indeed, there was nothing else in Africa save Ethiopia and Liberia, which had American support. He could not attack. Italy's demographics were slowing. The economy was slowing. Politically, he could unify the country under his fascism, provide new lands for farmers, new industries, new industrial production in this new land. It would get the country united behind fascism. Finally, Africa was backward in the Italian view. Italy would modernize it and fully use the resources of its country, which Selassie was not using. But they had to act quick, because, this was contradictory, Selassie was modernizing too, and if he did it fast, it would preclude Italy's chance to be master. That's what advisors of Mussolini told him. It was also his thinking. In his article, The Irrefutable Force, published in the Il Popolo d'Italia newspaper, July 1935, he said, There was a vital need. The Italian people need more space to expand. Space was short in Italy. This was the fascist government that cracked down on abortions, that taxed bachelors, that saluted marriages as early as possible and as many children as possible. They wanted the fascist state of Italy to grow and one more land to grow it in. Mussolini also threw out that while not a key reason for the annexation, the elimination of slavery in Ethiopia is a logical consequence of our policy and ever the propagandist. He's in the nadir of his relationship with Hitler and Nazi Germany. He found an opportunity through propaganda to sideswipe Germany. And we do not intend to present ourselves as the world as the great champions of the white race, Mussolini said. Opposition to fascism didn't hail from Harlem, but from white people in Europe and America. His words anyway, and soon it would be proven very wrong. We need to ensure East Africa's military security. So, and he's speaking here to France, who is hoping at the time that Italy will be its ally in this early stage. A bulwark against Nazi Germany, perhaps. So, we can perform our functions in Europe without fear of difficulties in Africa or elsewhere. He's saying a lot. He's saying, this might be reminiscence of world events today, we have security issues that we need to solve. That's why I may need to attack here. He's also saying, France, butt out, or I won't help you with your needs. There are mostly bogus reasons. Selassie and his government was more than willing to treat with Italy. There were mechanisms set up in the Treaty of 28 where they could deal with conflicts. Selassie's troops never crossed the border. However, Ethiopian troops did patrol on their own side to be sure his Italians weren't encroaching. While Wall is in Ethiopia, but it's right on the border of Eritrea. And there are a thousand wells there. In this country, wells are highly valuable. They are passed through families. Italian Eritrean troops are occupying some of these and built a small fort. The British ask to parlay with the Italian commander there. He refuses. The British not wanting to start an international incident, and obviously something going on the border between these countries, leave. Someone threw something. Maybe it was a bone. Maybe it was an insult. Maybe someone shot a rifle in the air or just held a rifle in the air. Whatever happened, both sides began shooting. But the Ethiopians, though now engaged, didn't seem as ready for all of this as the Italians did. Within 10 minutes, three planes of the Italian Air Force and two tanks appeared on the scene. The Ethiopians had to withdraw, losing 107 men in the gunfire. Walwal was pointed to by the Italians as a provocation. And... As the, by the Ethiopians as an intrusion in their land designed to stir up trouble. Selassie demanded an apology and reparations for the Ethiopians killed. Mussolini did neither, and after five Italian Akari, Somali foreign legions, were killed in the same year, Mussolini began sending troops to his colonies, building up prior to an invasion. Ethiopia almost starts a war between Britain and Italy. Its location is near a British colony, British Somaliland, also British Sudan. It's near the Suez Canal. But Britain and France both try to get a compromise. However, it really amounts to treating Ethiopia like an Italian colony to propose an international mandate, which would hand over parts of the country to Italy while allowing Italian citizens the right to settle in any part of Ethiopia. Ethiopians would have to be satisfied with league-appointed European experts and technicians to help them. Mussolini turns the agreement down in any case. 
there's a problem on the world stage. France doesn't really want to intervene on behalf of Ethiopia because it wants its agreement with Italy as a bulwark against the possible Nazi threat to be present. Brit- as for Britain, they're a little bit more sympathetic. They don't want to act alone. Here's what Mussolini thinks. Instead of recognizing the rights of Italy, the League of Nations dares talk of sanctions. Until there is proof to the country, I refuse to believe that the authentic people of France will join in supporting sanctions against Italy. Until there is proof to the contrary, I refuse to believe that the authentic people of Britain will want to spill blood and send Europe to the catastrophe, to its catastrophe, for the sake of a barbarian country unworthy of ranking among civilized nations. Just the same, we cannot afford to overlook the possible developments. To economic sanctions, we shall answer with our discipline, our spirit of sacrifice, our obedience. To acts of war, we shall answer with acts of war. But Ethiopia had its supporters. Support among Americans, particularly African-American people, were evident at a meeting in Madison Square Garden September 1935 on the threat of invasion when 7,000 people show up to support Ethiopia. It's a mixed-race crowd, notes the newspaper. 500 young communists, this is 1936, and that's not as crazy to be a member of that party as it is today, um, or as it would be in 20 years, march down Broadway with an effigy of Mussolini holding a bloody knife. It's brought to the garden stage where people can jeer and boo it. Langston Hughes, in his poem, his call to Ethiopia is defiant. Abyssinian, son of Sheba's race, your palm trees tall and your mountains high are shade and shelter to men who die. Ethiopia is free. Be like me. All of Africa, arise and be free. He smacked the Italian fighter in the face and nearly knocked him down. But this was not part of the war. It was a real punch, followed by a jab, a jab, a hook, that knocked him to the ground, but he'd get up. Carrera was the, the ambling Alp, one of the strongest men in boxing, Mussolini's favorite, Italy's pride, and he knocked out a fighter so badly but he died two days later. He was six foot six, 260 pounds. A publicity release about Carrera said, for breakfast, he had a quart of orange juice, 14 eggs, 19 pieces of toast, and a half pound of Virginia ham. With his long arms, with his good shape, the ambling Alp might just have young Joe Lewis for breakfast too. But when they met at Yankee Stadium, June 25th, 1935, Lewis had an unexpected motivation. The fight was scheduled just as Mussolini was threatening this African country. Joe Lewis was fighting for all black people, maybe even Ethiopia. Certainly his promoters didn't mind if ticket holders and the media saw it that way. It was drummed up in the press, 60,000 fans and hundreds of sports writers came to the stadium to see it. Carrera towered over Lewis. He was five inches taller. When the fight starts, a few rounds of nothing much, sparring, jabbing, moving around. Does Lewis have this? Is he going to be able to to do anything to Carrera, or is Carrera just going to knock him out? Then came the fifth round. Ta, ta, ti, ti, ta. A right strong enough to bounce Carrera off the ropes. A left, and then another right. Carrera was hanging on to Lewis, so he wouldn't fall down. The bell rings, saving the Italian fighter. But the next round, he's back up. Lewis knocks him to the floor. He gets up, down again. Carrera's up, and ta ta titi. He collapses on the ropes, only the ropes holding him up. 
and the referee calls the fight. For any fascist-hating American in the audience, and we can't say it's the whole audience in 1935, Joe Lewis was a hero. Without a declaration of war, Italian troops under General De Bono came from Italian Eritrea. The pamphlets that they dropped from accompanying planes made the Italian mission clear to people at least the ostensible mission, they would restore to the throne the true heir, Emperor Ayasu V. It was a ruse, and not even a good one. Deposed many years earlier, Ayasu had not the support of Ali Selassie, and he was a prisoner of Italy, and everyone knew it. In the early stages of their march, the invaders accounted virtually no resistance. Since Italy was attacking Ethiopia without declaring war, Ethiopia had to declare war on Italy. It was not something Halil Selassie wanted to do. He was waiting for the League of Nations, the new international body formed in the wake of World War I. These days it would have been said in the wake of the World War to pull off some kind of last-minute fix for the big countries to solve this problem. He had no choice. He had to mobilize his country. His mobilization was too late in the opinion of some of his supporters. Ethiopian nationalists militarized and was crippled by world neutrality. The League of Nations wouldn't allow anyone to sell arms to either Ethiopia or Italy. And as for the United States, from the same New York Times article, we stay aloof. Why quit our own to stand upon foreign ground? Quoting George Washington. Tis our true policy to steer clear of permanent alliances with any portion of the foreign world. Speaking last Wednesday before 45,000 persons, Franklin Roosevelt, 32nd President of the United States, laid down a similar policy when he said, The American people can have but one concern and speak but one sentiment. Despite what happens in continents overseas, the United States of America shall and must remain, as long ago the father of the country prayed that it might remain, untangled and free. Long and loudly, the listeners cheered. This was the policy of America in 1935, and it was the mandate from Congress in a joint neutrality declaration binding Franklin Roosevelt's hands. If his hands even had to be bound, we're not talking about 1940 here. We're talking about 1935 in the middle of the New Deal, in the middle of the Great Depression. Roosevelt's focused inward, as is America. That will not be a benefit for Emperor Ali Selassie and his calls. So Selassie has to rely on his own men and calls up the order. All men and boys able to hold a spear go to the capital. Every married man will bring his wife to cook and wash for him. Woman, babies, the infirmed are excused. The emperor said, Anyone else found at home after receiving this order will be hanged. More from the Times. Airplane bombers led the way for the Italians as they opened their offensive. And leading the bombers was Nobile Galeazzo Siano, the son of Mussolini. Thursday morning bombs rained down on the collection of mud huts that makes up Adoa where Ethiopian warriors humiliated the Italian army 39 years ago. It resulted in 1,700 casualties, the Ethiopians say including women and children. Ethiopians guarding the trails leading to Adowa held on so tenaciously that early yesterday morning airmen were called on to dislodge them. The planes flew low, and Selassie's warriors got their first take, a machine gun fire from the air. Indeed, as the article suggests, there was progress in the first few days. Italian motorized corps had troubles in the country that had no roads, really. There were roads in the Italian colony of Eritrea, but not when they crossed the border. 
And the Ethiopian army, at least on paper, was enormous. Even Italian battle plans had them at 700,000, more than Italy had in Africa. Italy made every attempt to overprepare, calling in units from Eritrea, from their other colony to the south of Ethiopia, in Italian Somaliland, from Italy, from Libya. But they would face one thing, a very large army under the emperor's command, very motivated to fight. And despite the spear talk, there were lots of rifles. Maybe not the best rifles, but the majority had them. And they had hundreds, at least, of artillery. Foreign mercenaries raced to the cause of Ethiopia. A French pilot veteran, a handful of Russians, some Austrians, a small Swedish military mission, as well as Cuban revolutionaries and a few Belgians, probably 50 in number. These foreign units helped advise, sometimes served in a medical capacity. The Italians exaggerated how many the Ethiopians had because anything good the Ethiopians did in the resulting war, they would blame on these foreign Ferengis, exaggerating their numbers. In Africa, the Italians were capable of bringing 600,000 to battle, though the initial assault had 150 to 200,000. They had 600 tanks, Thousands of machine guns, thousands of artillery pieces. Some of their soldiers were local Eritreans fighting for Italy. In three days, the Italians had taken Adoa. And this is important because it's a very symbolic victory. In 1896, the Ethiopians had defeated the Italians. That's 40 years before, but carved into the memory of both countries. An Italian army, foolishly, about ten to 15,000, entered Ethiopia and was swallowed, encircled, and destroyed by a larger Ethiopian force. They had not expected to get that much resistance. Forty years later, they weren't going to let this happen again. But although they had taken the symbolic city of Ottawa, they're still in the north fringes of the country, and they hadn't really fought that much. Emperor Selassie had ordered his army not to defend the border, to move back. This was both for strategy to preserve his army, and also to look good for the League of Nations, that he was indeed the victim here. The Italians took a small army on October 11th at Adagamos, a few hundred soldiers. Italy made much of the victory. The Italians declared that slavery was over in Ethiopia to maximize the propaganda advantage. But two months in, and the Italians were still on the fringes, 300 miles from the capital. This is where Mussolini changes his generals. It's grinding a bit now. Supply is harder the deeper you get in. Some Italian units are caught in, are caught, sniped at from hilltops, having trouble moving through mud, stopped in mountain passes and ambushed. Supply caravans are attacked. Even non-military Ethiopians were able to cut telephone lines, engage in some guerrilla warfare, killed any Ethiopian collaborators with Italy ambushed messengers and convoys, lit fuel depots on fire, all guerrilla activities designed to slow the invasion. This in the New York Times, November 1935. The Italian morale is believed to be cracking under the strain of continuous guerrilla warfare from unseen warriors in nightly raids, fading with daylight to invisibility. The attacks are coming not from the Ethiopian government, but from local tribes. The same article said, Ali Selassie would be on CBS radio in America to ask individual Americans, that's all he was allowed to do, for their assistance. At the same time, FDR was saying, any of our people who voluntarily engage in transactions do so at their own risk. December 1935, Italians received a PR black eye for bombing a Red Cross hospital in Addis Ababa. The hospital is far removed from town, and that is known to the Italians. A local doctor said, a big American flag and a red cross are on the roof. A Norwegian nurse was wounded. This made the papers throughout the world. They decide on a Christmas offensive. The emperor takes the momentum, throws 190,000 troops at the Italians, bringing in all of his northern armies. First, the emperor's cousin, Ras Imru, dispatched a small force designed to throw off the Italian air force. It works. The small force goes northwest, and then at night, the main army moves northeast. Three armies now combine in one place and attack the Italian army, taking back ground and taking back a few villages, forcing the Italians back to Axum, 
a historic city that they had taken over early in the war. News was censored. And for the Italian journalists, they weren't allowed to report things like this. But some of it got back to the world. And even in Italy, it was known that this December was the black period of the war. Three to 4,000 Italian soldiers were killed during this Christmas offensive. That's about a third of what they'd lose in the war. 18 tanks were captured, 30 field guns. Not only is the Ethiopian army on the offensive, but in the south, there's a rumor that a massive army's building to invade Italy's southern colony, Italian Somaliland. It's not looking good. There's confused reports, certainly. Reports are exaggerated. Reports of Italy's colonial local troops deserting are hard to verify, but those claims are made by the Ethiopians. One well-documented case of a desertion is an Italian soldier who goes to the Ethiopian side and provides information to the emperor about Italian positions and plans. And even amid this success, there are still a few issues for the Ethiopian army here. Ethiopia is operating at a 4 to 1 kill ratio in the good battles. They are losing four, man, four men for every one Italian. Their enemy can use aerial photography to see where they are, to see where their positions are. They can also use radios, which the Ethiopians do not have enough of. Their orders must go by horseback, or in some cases, the few airplanes that they have. The Italians are slowed a little. They did not get surprised as they had 40 years before. They were ready and had overwhelming force. This meant that the Ethiopians had to do everything right and not mess up and hope to win. The way the war is fought, between the Italians with technological superiority with airplanes and tanks and Ethiopians. The way that it's described in history is somewhat accurate, but it probably deserves a little more telling. The Ethiopians were very intense fighters, very motivated, willing to charge, willing to fight for their emperor, fight for their homeland, knew the territory, particularly when they could control the space where battles were fought. Tembien is an example of a competitive battle between the two armies. The Tembien region is a must-take for Italy in this. Its mountain passes and river gorges are the way into the south to reach the capital. But it's not tailor-made for a quick mobilized attack. And the Ethiopian army sees this as an opportunity to exact some losses on the invaders. The Italians advance in two columns, Eritrean troops first. This was the tendency of the Italian forces to put their colonial African troops first. Ras Kassa, the emperor's younger brother, and Ras Mengesha, another one of his generals, led 70,000 troops. And first bounced back the Italian column, then set in on the, Itri the first group of Eritreans. The Ethiopians hit one of the Eritrean divisions and drove them back. The main Italian army is forced into a mountain pass and can't advance anymore. It's known as Warsich. This is a pass where there's mountain to the left, mountain to the right, small mountain in the middle. There's maybe two miles in each of those passes. And they're stuck. The Italians can't retreat because, well, first of all, this is supposed to be an advance. And the Duce don't want to hear about that. And also, they're under attack. And retreating is not going to be good. The head general, Pedoglio, brought in more Etrians held in reserve to help back up these soldiers. But they're taking their time getting there. Meanwhile, the Ethiopian army has this contingent of Italians outnumbered. They're constantly attacking for three days, wave after wave, unyielding charges. But also, feeling that they were starting to get a bit of the edge here in this war. Enthusiastically charged, even when they're defenders and rifles, and machine guns. A machine gun is a killer weapon. That lesson was learned in the World War, but when you've got tens of thousands of people, you can even overrun machine guns in the right cases, in the right terrain. The Italians had another problem. They are running out of ammunition. So by the second day, they have to ration shots, and then they have to ration water. The Ethiopians have no let-up. There's 700 casualties among the Italians probably 5,000 or so among Ethiopians. But in this war, they'll take that, at least right now. By day three, running out of ammunition, Bagdolio considers a withdrawal of his advance. This is a key moment because retreating with 70,000 men, tanks, field guns, 14,000 draft animals, getting out of a mountain pass 
with energized Ethiopian fighters at their rear would be difficult to pull off and may have been a massacre. It may have been this war's Stalingrad or Yorktown, a surprising victory that ends the thing. The general holds on for one more day before ordering the retreat, incurs 1,100 casualties as defenders are not able to fully fight back without ammunition. The relief force makes it, and the Italian Air Force straffs and bombs the Ethiopian army, pushing them back to their base camp. Still, despite 8,000 lost, Ethiopia considers this a win. They showed they could fight the Italians, hold their ground, and cause casualties. For the Italian army, anytime the Ethiopians were using their precious supply of ammunition, that was a win to them. An odd thing, though, is in Ethiopia's favor here. Of all people, Nazi Germany supports them. Not really, not really supporting the cause in any way, but Nazi Germany is angered at Mussolini in 1935. This is not a good time for relations between Italy and Germany. Hitler orders credits for loans to the Ethiopian army, materials to be sent, two planes for attacking and a plane for the emperor's use, rifles, ammunitions, millions of rounds of ammunition. It's not a gift. And this isn't the best equipment that Germany has. It is a kind of no honor among thieves, cynical Axis power thinking. Hitler wanted to slow Mussolini down. You didn't want him to win in Ethiopia too quickly. And Germans were also angered that the Italians had blocked Hitler's takeover of Austria. They had intervened in the crisis in 1935. So in this 1935-1936 phase, before things were patched up between the two, Ethiopians received at least fair quality support from Germany. Had the war dragged another year, this support would have been withdrawn and Germany might have well helped Italy. But we're talking about 35-36. A last point on the Christmas offensive. Ras Imru, Emperor's cousin, had another plan. While our four armies moved upward to meet the Italians in those mountain passes, his army advances and then keeps going. His goal was not the invading army. He had a more daring plan. And but for a terrible new development... His plan might have worked. Rossimur, one of uh, Ethiopia's better generals, he has a force of 30,000. It's about to move past the Italian advancing forces and hit Eritrea, where supply and communication for the Italian army was. Italians didn't expect an attack in their colony. They expected to move right through the country and reach the capital. Italians didn't have enough infantry in that area to protect their supplies and communications, so they brought the air force out. This was a problem. Ethiopia could not counter in the air. But Ethiopia's soldiers had learned something. They weren't just sitting ducks. They learned how to dive to the ground to take cover when they saw airplanes. And on this day, when they saw the planes, that's exactly what they did. But there was no gunfire or even bombs to dodge. Instead, strange cylinders fell from the sky. They broke when they hit the ground. But instead of exploding, they gave off a liquid, visible only when it's distorted in the air, like moisture might appear on a desert highway like that, making things blurry. But it was colorless. Yet when the liquid touched the exposed limbs of any of the Ethiopian army, it burnt. Hundreds of soldiers had burnt hands, burnt feet, scalded faces. Some were blinded. Ras Imru, the general, said, I myself fled as if death was on my heels. It was so terrifying. So did his men. Arguably, the best moment of the war, just as they're going to take it to the enemy in their own territory, surprised them, was halted by something they didn't even know, had never seen before. And as it turns out, it was mustard gas. The U.S. observer in the Ethiopian army noted that of all the weapons used, mustard gas... It caused few deaths that I observed, but it incapacitated large numbers and so frightened the rest that the Ethiopian resistance broke completely. Mustard gas was most effective. The U.S. Army observer of the Italian Army noted the same, that instead of worrying about clearing mountain heights so the army could move forward, they would spray them, making them unoccupiable because of the presence of mustard gas. Those were the neutral observers. Elise Selassie was not so... Neutral, as he told the League of Nations. Sprayers were installed on board aircraft so they could vaporize over vast areas of fire, death-dealing rain. 
Selassie noted aircraft passed again and again. It wasn't just once. And it poisoned cattle in lakes. Those who ate the infected food or water also succumbed in dreadful suffering. These weapons are banned by the League of Nations, but so is this invasion. Mussolini says that after one of his generals was killed, he gave an order that as long as there was resistance, flamethrowers, gas could all be used. And that's going to define the rest of the 1936 phase of Italian, the Italian-Ethiopian War. It's anticlimactic. There are a few more battles. The Ethiopians will not have another uh, anything that could be called a victory. Emperor Haile Selassie, after a attempt to charge the Italian army with his finest emperor's guard, that final battle, decides to leave the country and call for a strategy of exile to save to save as many Ethiopian lives as he can. He'll go to the French colony of Djibouti. He'll go to British Jerusalem, make speeches. He'll then eventually go to the League of Nations and make a plea that has gone down in history. While he's doing this, most of his troops are staying. They'll fight for another year, and guerrilla tactics never stopped. I, Haile Selassie, Emperor of Ethiopia, am here today to claim that justice, which is due to my people, and the assistance promised to it eight months ago when 50 nations asserted that aggression had been committed there's no precedent for a head of state himself speaking in this assembly. But there's also no precedent for people being a victim of such injustice and being at present threatened by abandonment to its aggressor. Also, there has never been an example of any government proceeding to the systematic extermination of a nation by barbarous means in violation of the most solemn promises made by the nations of the earth that there should not be used against innocent human beings the terrible poison of harmful gases. I pray to Almighty God that he might spare nations the terrible sufferings that have just been inflicted on my people, and of which the chiefs who accompany me here have been the horrified witnesses. It is not only upon warriors that the Italian government has made war, it has above all attacked populations far removed from hostilities. The Rome government, today openly proclaimed, has never ceased to prepare for the conquest of Ethiopia. The treaties of friendship it signed with me were not sincere. Their only object was to hide their real intention from me. The Italian government asserts that for 14 years it has been preparing. The Ethiopian government never expected other governments to shed their soldiers' blood to defend the covenant when their own immediately personal interests were not at stake. Ethiopian warriors asked only for means to defend themselves. On many occasions, I have asked for financial assistance, for the purchase of arms. That assistance has been constantly refused me. What then in practice is the meaning of Article 16 of the Covenant? What then in practice is the meaning of collective security? I ask the 52 nations who have given the Ethiopian people a promise to help them in their resistance to the aggressor. What are they willing to do for Ethiopia? And the great powers who have promised the guarantee of collective security to small states on whom weighs the threat that they may one day suffer the fate of Ethiopia. I ask, what measures do you intend to take? Representatives of the world, I have come to Geneva to discharge in your midst the most painful of the duties of the head of a state. What reply shall I have to take back to my people? By April 26, 1936, Badoglio moves into Addis Ababa victoriously, but it's a city undefended. It's all for show. Nevertheless, he brings a cavalcade of thousands of motorized vehicles, the Brigade of Iron Will, it is called, into Italy's newest colony. Nearly half of Ethiopia is still unoccupied, but the Italian press doesn't share this news. And there's celebrations, and not just in Italy, in Madison Square Garden, where a few months before, there had been a large protest of Italy. Now, Italian-American groups celebrate this victory. 
16,000 Italian Americans meet in the garden to celebrate the victory and raise money for the Italian cross. Just to show that it wasn't about color, they bring up to the stage Eritrean African soldiers wearing their red fezes, marching along with a squad of black shirts. This in New York City. The Italian Council to New York said it was a great victory for civilization. In Elizabeth, New Jersey, 1,000 men parade. Marchers form in front of St. Anthony's Church there and then march through the Italian section of town. In Harlem in New York City, there's a riot where two Italian stores have broken windows and their produce thrown into the street. When police come and one shoots a revolver, a man is wounded. Now there's hundreds of people on the street throwing garbage can, pelting officers with rocks. Fifty police are needed to quell the riot. But Ethiopia isn't yet lost. Its government in Gore and at least will mount another attempt to retake the capital. It is pushed back. Eventually, by 1937, Italians control most of Ethiopia. There's still guerrilla fighting. Black Lions, Patriot organizations continue resistance. Italy's air marshal and 12 officers are killed in an ambush. Three aircraft are also destroyed when they go to talk to locals. In retaliation, the Italians bomb the local town. But the worst violence is on February 19th, Yekati 12, on the Ethiopian calendar. An assassination attempt was made on the Italian-Ethiopian military governor that was installed, Marshal Graziani. Rebels throw a grenade when he's speaking, and then another. He runs. They don't know if he's dead or alive. In return, Italians are given orders to fire on any Ethiopian in Addis Ababa that they see. I give you carte blanche. That's what the order says. I give you carte blanche for three days, says Federal Secretary Guido Cortese. Houses are set on fire. Beggars are killed. Anyone, people who pull servants out of houses in the capital and shoot them. Almost 20% of the population, it's estimated, 19,000 were murdered in this massacre. Of course, these deaths are horrific, but the whole war overall brought exceedingly large casualties between bombings, gassing, massacre, village destruction, guerrilla war casualties after the taking of the capital. A total of 760,000 Ethiopians were killed. And official estimates on the Italian side are 10 to 12,000. In Italy, Mussolini would never be more popular with the addition of this country to Italy's empire. Fantastic promises were made about how railroads were going to be built, swift colonization, railroad, school building, factories. Italians were solicited to move to Ethiopia immediately. But it wasn't without cost. Ethiopia's occupation cost Italy more than its entire nation's annual budget. 19 billion. They needed to keep 250,000 soldiers there during the application, more than they planned during the occupation, more than they planned. And the world condemnation came. The League did expel Italy, December 1936, December 1937. There are few traces left of Italy. The occupation would be short. There are few traces left of Italy in Ethiopia. Well, Eritrea has Italian and Colonial architecture, espresso espresso cafes, fiat stations, fiat gas stations. Only a couple of Italian-looking buildings are in Addis Ababa at all. You can get spaghetti or lasagna in Eritrea. There's some of that in Ethiopia, but remaining Italian families, those who had stayed after World War II, they were forced to leave by the communist regime that would come in 1974. I mean, there's more to this story of the Italian-Ethiopian War than is often told. For five years after he leaves, Haile Selassie does return to the throne of Ethiopia. Yes, it's after Italy's been largely defeated in the war, suffering losses, and yes, it's with the help of British allies. After a few years of exile in London, he moves to the Sudan, starts building up that resistance. By January 1941, Selassie enters Ethiopia again, and by May, he retakes his throne. Italy will keep fighting, now reversing their position. They're now the guerrillas, and there's Italian guerrilla fighting for the next two years. Eventually, Italy has to recognize Ethiopian independence and pay 25 million in reparations. Rastafani, Ali Selassie, continues to rule the country. Travels around the world, is a world figure, 
Ethiopia is going to be a country in Africa that stands up to colonization, that stands up to Italy when they try to take some colonies back, that stands up for justice in a lot of ways. Selassie is criticized. Remember, he's a monarch. What he does to political opposition. He runs the country until 1974 when he's overthrown by communist forces who then assassinate him in 1975 and make Ethiopia Soviet-friendly communist state until they are overthrown in 1991. You know, I'm not going to connect the dots here. If something that you're hearing sounds like recent events, yeah, so be it. But make your interpretation. I want to thank you for listening. 